Hey there, I'm Diana, and I'm a product manager at a big tech company in Silicon Valley, California. And I bring you the best tips to help you get into product management and show you how you can be successful once you've made it. If you're preparing for a product management interview coming up, you're probably gonna get questions like this. What goals would you set for X product? How would you define success for X product? How would you measure whether X product is successful or not? In this episode, we're gonna share a framework to help you think clearly and logically about this question so that you can stand out in the interview. First, let's go over what the goals are of why companies even ask this type of question. The company wants to check that you understand the product, the value of the product to the multi-sided users. The second thing, they wanna check that you can prioritize the most impactful metrics for the business and for the users. A non-goal is to come up with something like driving monthly active users by 5%. We're not looking for an exact number, but we do want to understand how you would come up with an exact number. In another episode of this product management interview series, we mentioned the goal of these interviews is to show interviewers and the company that you know how to think like a product manager. So if how you're answering these questions is memorizing a set of metrics, that's not going to show the interviewer that you can think. So today I'm going to show you how you can show the interviewer that you're a great product thinker. Let's first run through a structure of how to tackle these questions. The first part of this structure is product users and value. So what is this product we're talking about? Who are the users and what value are they deriving from using this product? The second part of this structure is the North Star metric. The North Star metric should be something at the intersection of the value that these users are getting from the product. The third, you wanna break down the North Star metric into a formula so you can understand what levers need to be driven to increase this North Star metric. And the fourth, you wanna talk about trade-offs and counter metrics. So trade-offs are to show that you know what metric to prioritize and counter metrics or to show you understand it's not enough to just drive up the metric, but you wanna ensure quality and that your metric isn't being gamed. Let me now show you an example of how this framework can be used to answer a set a goal for product X type of question. And you'll see that this is probably simpler than some of the frameworks you've memorized with metrics. So let's dive in. So the example question we're gonna go through today is what metric goal would you set for Airbnb? I just chose Airbnb at random, so no, I don't work there. Let's talk about the first part of our structure, the product, users, and value. So what is Airbnb? Airbnb is a marketplace that connects guests who are looking for places to stay with hosts who are renting out their places. What's special about Airbnb? is hosts rent out their extra apartment or rent out their extra room, which is different from the hotel model. And the founders created Airbnb to give people traveling a more local, homey, and affordable experience than hotels. Let's talk about the three different users here. The first is the guest. A guest is successful when they make a booking because it indicates they've found something on the site that they've liked. A host is successful when they get their place booked because they earn money from that. And Airbnb, the company, is also successful when a place gets booked because they earn a commission from each booking. So let's move on to the second part of the framework, the North Star metric. I mentioned you can think about the North Star metric as the intersection of value for all three users. In this case, the intersection you'll see is bookings. When a booking is made, all three parties are happy, hopefully. So in this case, we can think about the North Star metric as the number of nights booked. And why number of nights booked versus bookings? 
because the more nights booked, the more a host earns. And the more a host earns, the more Airbnb makes. And also for the guests, if they decide to stay short term or long term, they're also happy because they're able to find a place to stay. If any parts of this is confusing or you have a follow-up question, make sure to comment below and I'm happy to follow up after. Now let's go into the third section of this framework and break down the North Star metric, the number of nights booked we just talked about. So that metric is made up of the total number of active guests times the number of nights booked per guest. Let's further break down the right-hand side into the number of active listings and views of those listings, confirmed bookings, minus the number of canceled bookings. If we were to further break down the number of active listings, that would give us the number of active hosts and the listings per host. And now let's further break down the number of active hosts, which is the number of new hosts plus existing on the platform plus resurrected minus churn. So you can see we broke down the formula of the North Star metric to help us understand what drives this North Star metric if we want to tactfully improve this metric. It also shows us the levers in creating a healthy ecosystem. So in this case, one part of keeping a healthy ecosystem is having a macro and micro supply that is greater than demand by, let's say, X to Y ratio. Keeping a healthy supply higher than demand is key to keep customers, in this case, guests engaged because if guests don't feel like they have enough supply on Airbnb, they'll easily go to bookings.com to book a hotel. So we want to make sure every time they're on, a on Airbnb, they at least feel like there's plenty of supply. Supply needs to be managed in a macro and micro sense, meaning total number of supply should outweigh demand. But even for specific places and locations, we have to keep a healthy ratio of supply to demand. So for example, I know every time I go to Big Sur in California, there's always such a low amount of supply that the prices end up being very high with places charging $500 a night in the middle of nowhere. So in those cases, Airbnb loses me as a customer because I'm going to bookings.com to find a hotel instead. At the same time, the quality of supply is important. Just because there's a million listings doesn't mean they're all good. And especially on Airbnb because it's people's homes and not professional establishments, it might be hard for them to take a high quality photo compared to the hotel photos. Hence, in order to get engagement and views of the listings, it'll require the, the listing to look nice. And that's why the founders early on, in order to jumpstart this ecosystem, they actually flew to New York and volunteered to help host take picture, nice pictures of their listings. And you'll see even on the platform today, they offer a professional photography service. And the third part of keeping this healthy ecosystem is growing demand. Demand as in guests. You want to ensure the number of your guests are increasing organically, coming from word of mouth. Word of mouth happens when existing users have a good experience. For example, on Airbnb, when I'm traveling, I'm usually going on a trip with friends or family. And hence, if we have a good experience, that means the friends and families who go with me in the future will look to Airbnb to book their next vacation. Hence, we need to double down on creating good hosts and educating them on best practices. Hence, the existing guests serve as advocates 
and ends up creating a multiplier effect for future guests, which means Airbnb has to do really good at upfront getting hosts to provide a good experience, but also when guests don't have a great experience, they need to provide the service, customer service, to help them so they trust Airbnb. Otherwise, again, these guests can easily go to booking.com and default to what was the status quo before Airbnb. So our fourth part of the structure is talking about trade-offs and countermetrics. Under trade-offs, one example is the trade-off between optimizing for hosts who have single listings or few listings versus more commercial hosts who are either listing for other people who are property managers or landlords that are listing multiple places. So when we think about increasing supply, do we want to partner with more established organizations of landlords and property managers, even hotel chains? And you actually do see that on the platform today. Airbnb partners with hotels or encourages hotels to now show supply of hotel rooms on Airbnb. And the second part of the fourth part of this structure is countermetrics. We can most definitely increase lots of supply of hosts, but we want a supply of hosts who provide good experiences so that other people would be just as satisfied with the booking. In this case, I would check the number of listings that have less than four star reviews. Gives me an indication of high quality versus medium low quality on the platform. And I wanna make sure I maintain a healthy ratio of high quality listings. B, I'd also track the number of listings reported. That can give me an indication of listings that should be taken down, that go against our policies. Again, showing maybe low quality supply that we wouldn't want on the platform, even if it helped us grow our numbers. So I hope that example helped clarify how to use that structure. I would recommend you practice a couple of questions and see if this framework helps you think clearer, faster, and more logically. And why this framework works is because it's simple. This is versus other metrics frameworks, which asks you to list down a bunch of metrics that are usually used for internet companies. And sure, those aren't wrong, and it's not terrible, but it's not gonna distinguish you from all the other interviewees who memorize the same framework. The last thing I want to call out from my experience are suboptimal answers. Again, they're not wrong answers, but I hear them all the time to the point where they're almost generic. The first one is when someone I'm interviewing says the North Star metric is revenue. Again, not wrong, but not optimal. If a company continues to prioritize revenue and not the user goals, eventually it's going to run out of users and engagement to be able to make any revenue. The second thing I hear all the time is, we want more growth, grow more users, is the North Star metric always? Also, not the answer. Imagine you have a product where there's 100 million users, but none of those 100 million users are taking the action that you need them to take in order for your company to monetize. That's not ideal either. And the third thing I hear, we talked about how people tend to memorize a framework the usual framework that I hear is the pirate metrics are that's awareness, acquisition, retention, revenue, and referral. So again, it's not a wrong answer. It's just the answer everyone uses. So by the time I hear it for the 500th time, it doesn't help me understand how you think. It just tells me that you know how to memorize. So to summarize, the four things you want to cover in a question like, what goals would you set for this metric is number one, the product, the user, and the value. 
the second one, coming up with the North Star metric, which is the intersection of the values for the users. The third is breaking down your North Star metric to understand the formula or the levers to contribute to this metric. And number four, it's thinking through trade-offs and counter metrics. So you avoid gaming your North Star metric. So if this was helpful, let me know in the comments below what follow-up questions you might have and make sure to like the video to show your support. Thanks guys. Hey guys, here are two more videos to help you stand out during the product manager interview.